Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and today we are going to begin a series, Navigating the Journey. This program is dedicated to exploring the options and choices at the end of life, and to help people talk about these issues, to bring them out, to look at the different options we have, the different choices we have, and as we move through the series, we will talk to people who have different traditions, different um, ways of dealing with these uh, things, different religions, and all of those kind of things that give us an opportunity to have a real conversation about the end of life and the options and choices. And so we want you to stay with us to send us uh, your comments and what your feelings are about end of life. And since the government has so much to do with what we do, how we do it, and I say interfere in our lives. Uh, we have asked representative or former representative Blake Oshiro, who is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and Blake has been a friend for years. Blake was in the legislature for 11, 11 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you worked as the majority leader. You worked in the governor's office, yes. uh, Abercrombie? Yes. As, uh, what was? The deputy chief of staff. De oh, wow. So that was public policy and budget yes. and what all did you? And overseeing um, about three or four departments as well. Wow. Well, so we've asked Blake to come because of that depth of knowledge of how the government works or doesn't work in any case. <laughs> And um, to, to talk about the practices of whether that's interfering in someone in our lives, is it to protect our lives? What, what is it that we get from the government in their position on end-of-life choices? Oh, thanks so much for having me, Marcia. <laughs> it's a really important topic. I'm glad to be here. So tell us, what is it that the government does or why do they um, impose their will on people at the end of their lives? I mean, you know, you, we, we get to choose who we marry. Mm -hmm. We get to choose what school we want to go to. We get to choose to get on a plane and go. So what is it about this particular issue and the choices? And, uh, the role of government, especially for a lot of issues when it comes to health care, is really about protecting patients and making sure that there is not only adequate access, but there are the proper safeguards so that there is not any abuse. And so that really is a marching theme when it comes to aid in dying or end of life issues is is the government actually properly regulating this space or is it over regulating and being too prescriptive in terms of what people's choices are what do you mean over uh, what how do they do that over regulating yeah so back in 1997 governor ben cayetano at that time established the blue ribbon panel and he wanted to look at the panoply of what are the issues associated with end of life. And at that time, the Blue Ribbon Panel came up with a lot of recommendations in a report in 1998. And the government since that time has actually enacted a lot of those recommendations when it comes to issues such as um, a living will or an advanced health care directive or making improvements with palliative care or with pain management. Um, but the one issue that the government still has not dealt with for the state of Hawaii came to death with dignity. And so that remains the large outstanding piece of that recommendation that we still are looking at. So um, let's, let's go back to the pain management and hospice and palliative. What, I mean, those are excellent programs. So what is it that's going on there? You know, back in the late 90s, I think people were aware that there were certain options, but I don't think that people really had a full discussion. And I think that 
patients when they were faced with terminal illness felt very uncomfortable about talking a lot of these things with their physicians. And so it's really great to see that the system responded and came up with a lot of different options for folks. And what we see now is hospice is just something everybody is aware of. They kind of know what it is. Um, they have that as a full discussion with their physician as one of the options. Um, pain management, of course, and palliative care remain something that there is a specialty. Doctors really are focused on how to provide that to patients. But even with those options for a terminally ill patient, sometimes those are not enough and they want to control their own destiny. Well, now, you know, growing up in the South, you had people were born at home, people died at home. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, there was never any discussion about going to the hospital and being wired up and all of that sort of stuff. You just sort of accepted that this was the normal way that the end of life came. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the body was in the house and people came to view the body and, and had these great meals. There was always a wonderful meal <laughs> that, that went with, yeah. went with uh, see, paying respects to the family and the body. And at what point did we lose that? You know, I think, uh, you know, we are so lucky to live in the country we live in, in modern technology. And we've seen that modern medicine really has the ability to enhance people's lives, but it also has that burden of prolonging somebody's life, perhaps when they don't want it to. And so that is why, especially for terminally ill patients or folks that are in a vegetative state, um, you do need to fill out things like an advanced care directive. You need to make it clear that if there is no brain activity, I don't want to be just kept alive on machines and being fed with machines and being liquefied. And that is my choice. And so that is something that had to develop since the 80s and into the 90s and become more commonplace. Um, but it really is sort of the dichotomy of medical science has become so good at treating us, the question sometimes becomes, is it too good? And it's not what you would prefer for the end of your life. I, it just seems to me so impersonal to be in the hospital with all the wires and what have you, and with people you don't know, mm -hmm. as opposed to being close with family and friends and that, that this was the way you want to go. This is your choice at the time. It, I mean, it just seems comfortable that um, the end of life should be as sacred as the beginning of life. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting you bring that up. You know, when you look at the Oregon experience, they've had this Death with Dignity program to allow terminally ill patients to get access to um, a lethal medication. What you see in the data is a large, large majority end up choosing their location of where they want to pass. And that by and large, overwhelming majority is they want to be at home. Oh. They want to be surrounded by their loved ones. They want to have that opportunity to be cognizant, be lucid, say their goodbyes in a proper way and then pass. Mm -hmm. um, rather than I think what you're sort of talking about, which is if you're in a hospital, you may be doped up on morphine, you're not cognizant, really what is that quality in your last days? Well, now speaking of the hospital, the big, big thing of course is who pays the bill? When, when uh, somebody just keeps the, with all the, uh, medical, the, the, the physician, the nurses, the aides, the uh, equipment and all of that. I, at one point I know that the feds picked up the bill, but now I don't think that, I don't know. Who pays for that? Yeah, uh, most people in Hawaii, we're fortunate that we have medical insurance. Uh, so you do have to have your copay. So it is somewhat of a, of a burden. But it drives to a larger question when you look at the data. In those final few weeks or months that people are passing away in the hospital, when you compare that cost 
versus how much actually healthcare costs they've gone through in their entire life. It actually is, for terminally ill patients, it ends up being a, about three-fourths of the cost is actually for those final few months. And it's because of that 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care that is extremely exorbitant. And it's a larger question of not so much about finances, but is that the best way to be investing funds, especially if somebody chooses to have some, a different scenario? Yeah. So uh, now, if you're in the hospital and you don't have a directive, you don't have this piece of paper that says, don't, do not resuscitate, what happens? Then at that point, it's really up to your family. If you are not capable of making your own decision, if the doctor deems that medically you are not of sound mind, um, then at that point, it really is up to your living relative. First, your spouse. Um, if you don't have a spouse, then it would be up to the children uh, to make that decision. And unfortunately, we've seen several times in high profile cases on the mainland where the wishes of a spouse are different than that of the children and you end up in court fighting it over in litigation. So that is why it is so important for people to have an advanced health care directive so that they make it clear what their wishes are and then it actually is something that li very, very seldomly is able to be legally challenged. Well, so if they have different opinions and just that, like I said, the part of the family does one thing and part of the other. What are the legal, is the hospital legally bound to just keep you on that ventilator or whatever? Yeah, if there is a family member that challenges the decision to end someone's life, then at that point the they will go to court and the hospital will then be enjoined from taking action. So a person can be stuck. Uh, in that stasis until the court makes its final oh, decision. How awful. Yeah. Oh. And, yeah. and then you get the bill. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. But, okay. it, but it, I think it's even more so awful when you look at how it just splinters apart families. It does. Right? I mean, you know, I, I would think that the person that is lying there, that is not what they would want. No, of, course of course not. they want their family to get along. And that is one of the good things that you do see about more we talk about end-of-life options. I think the more people become comfortable with it, the more they can actually approach their family and talk about it and tell them what their options are and what their wishes are. Well, I hope, well that's our intention with this series, is to have a conversation about all of the different paths that you can take to get there, because not all of us have the same traditions, the same religions, the same aspirations. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we're looking at, is to look at all of these conversations to make people comfortable with talking about it. Uh, I mean, we, we do have to, at some point, yeah. talk about it. And, and so that's, that is our goal, to really look at where we're going, how we get there, and the fact that all of these paths are valid. Yes. And there's not just one way to do that. No. And, oh. and so that was why we wanted to talk about the state first mm -hmm. before we start looking at all of these other paths to see what obstacles there are. Are there obstacles to having your own path? Are there, does the state put in barriers to you choosing how you want to do this? Are there? Yeah, I, I don't know if the state has put in barriers, but there are traditional laws that don't necessarily fit with the situation. A good example would be uh, the physician's liability, right? If a person, a terminally ill patient, decides that they want to end their own life, a physician actually is not only ethically prohibited from you know, supposedly providing lethal medication, but they're also legally prevented because oh. then they, that medication is actually the cause of the death and hastening that death. So there are legal barriers um, which existed for good reason, um, but in today's modern medicine and with the proper safeguards, I think there's a way to find the right balance so that it's the option for the terminally ill patient, just terminally ill patients, if that's what, how they decide they want to pass this world. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to go take a break. 
and we will be right back. Stay with us. There's a lot to talk about, and I promise you we will go through lots and lots of wonderful people, meet great uh, a traditionalist, uh, a rabbi, a Greek Orthodox, a bishop from uh, the Buddhist tradition, so that we get a look at all of these options, not just something that I'm made up. So we will take a break and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Crystal from Quok Talk. I've got a new show here. You've got to tune in, check out my topics on sensitive, provocative female issues. So Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It's going to be fun and dangerous. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Reg Baker, and I'm the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We're a show that broadcasts live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30. We highlight success stories in Hawaii of both businesses and individuals. We learn their secrets to success, which is always valuable. I hope to see you on our next show. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Chantal Seville, the host of The Savvy Chick Show. You can watch the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Honolulu time and enjoy how to be inspired and empowered. If you're a woman or girl, everyone is welcome, but it's really dedicated to you. And we look forward to seeing you. You can also find us on thinktechhawaii.com. See you soon. Aloha. Aloha, and we're back. And I'm Marcia Joyner. If you just tuned in, we are having a discussion about the end of life choices. We are navigating the journey. And I'm, we're, it's a long journey with lots of options and lots of roads, so stay with us. Our guest today is former legislator Marcus. No, Blake. Blake. Yes. Oh, God. Different Oshiro. Different Oshiro. Oh, mercy. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Blake Oshiro who was in the legislature for a long, long yeah, time. 11 years. Mm -hmm. And in the governor's office for yes. how long? For three years. With Governor Abercrombie. Abercrombie. Yes. And now you're a consultant? Correct. Correct. And you're also an attorney? Yes. And he is absolutely a jewel. You can see how, they, what do you do? Work out <laughs> and whatnot? I try. I try to stay healthy. It, it is okay. Healthy, yes. healthy, healthy. So we don't have to yes. worry about losing you. And, but Blake has an in-depth knowledge of the workings of the government from being in and, and as an advocate as well as a legislator. And that is the reason we wanted to talk to Blake to set the stage, to look at what, what is out there, what we need to be concerned with as we go down this road toward the end of life. And my feeling is that it's sacred. The end of life should be as sacred, as pleasant as the beginning of life. And I have to tell you a story, and everybody that knows me knows I have stories. And I'm a drama queen. <laughs> so I had made a big deal out of the fact that my mother was with me when I took my first breath. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I had to be with her when she took her last. Mm -hmm. So we had hospice and we had her in our home for the last year of her life. So the day came, and I don't even know why I knew, but I crawled into bed with her. Mm. And so that we had that moment that when she took her last breath, breath, I was with her. And then we called everybody in the family, all the hospice people came, and we had a bedside ceremony instead of a funeral. And Judith came and, and and bathed her in some kind of wonderful local oils and made the beds and the flowers, people, you know, in the bed with her and dressed her so beautifully and everything. So we got to do this ceremony. The minister from hospice mm -hmm. came and one of the hospice workers had this great contralto voice. Oh, it was absolutely the most beautiful 
ceremony and all of those years of pain were gone. Mm. She was so beautiful. Mm -hmm, Her mm -hmm. skin was like brown velvet. It was just the greatest moment of my life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to see her in no pain because she had emphysema and, and watching her struggle to breathe and to see her leave so lovely, so peaceful. And then my number one son looked at her and she smiled. Oh, poor baby, he cried like a bathtub overflowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was a beautiful moment. It was so beautiful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that everyone should have a moment like that. Well, that, that should be a great be, story. That, and that, that, that should be how most people pass this world. Yeah. I agree. And so, anyway, let's get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So your position now is to help us navigate through the, the weeds of the state, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that what we're going to do as we move forward with this series? We want to look at the, what I'm calling the weeds of down in the, the belly of the state and how we can move through this smoothly with all these different paths we have, what it is, what can we do, how can we get through the minutia? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, so currently there are laws that would prohibit somebody from taking their own life, um, and rightfully so. But I think especially for a terminally ill patient, I think there are very limited circumstances where they should be allowed to control their own destiny. So hopefully that they aren't suffering in days and weeks of inextricable pain so that they can actually enjoy a situation and be lucid enough to have those final moments with their family exactly like how you had illustrated for us and how significant that can be. But a lot of those things can only happen if we make some changes to the current law because what we really need to do is clear the pathway so that physicians feel that they can do this and they are not going to be held legally responsible, so that patients are aware that this is an option for them and how they can do it in a way that will be safe and actually will be in a manner that we can ensure there aren't going to be abuses. And so we need to find uh, the laws that can help us get to that objective. Now, tell me, what is the difference of doing something at home and in turning off the ventilator in the hospital, which seems to me terribly cruel, mm -hmm. that you withhold uh, water and turn off the ventilator? I know my mother struggled forever with trying to breathe because she had emphysema. If you had turned off the ventilator, how that seems to me to be terribly suffering. Yes, yes. Yeah, and so usually when we're talking about... And the doctors aren't held liable for that. Yeah, so usually when we're talking about turning off the machines, it's because it's an advanced healthcare directive. And usually that's because the brain has been declared dead and there is no activity. So the person just really will not survive. And what you're turning off is either the air, the ventilator that keeps the lungs pumping, you, you are turning off or not giving them uh, food and or water, um, which is often the other way that people just continue to just live, even if their lungs are working. Right. Um, their brain isn't working. Um, so the other way that they can choose to end their life is through not having artificial um, nutrition provided. And, and those are not very pretty situations at all. They are not. Um, but they are very limited in the circumstances of brain death, the vegetation. Um, and what we're talking about here is actually what do we do for a terminally ill patient who is very cognizant, aware of what they want to do, and chooses to have a different scenario for how they pass. And that is something that we really need more discussion on, is are there different options besides they can go to hospice, they can go through pain management and care, their physician can even prescribe them heavy doses of painkillers, but those also have their side effects. Is there a better way? And well, I think that's but a Amanda, conversation. If, you, if you're uh, terminally ill, do you really care about the side effects? Yeah, so, um, you <laughs> know, come on, the, you know, if you give a person 
opiates and you say, well, that'll make you addicted. Well, come on, you only have, you know, a week to go. What difference does it make? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, if somebody is terminally ill, um, some of the side effects like addiction are not that important. But the other side effects like loss of, of clarity, the fuzziness that goes on, if you are being really heavily doped up with morphine so that you're barely conscious, then though that to me is an entirely different scenario. That's that's different, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because my thought, well, for me anyway, I want to enjoy this last and look forward to, because with my sense of adventure, there's got to be something over there. There's got to be an adventure on the other side, and I'm totally willing to do that. And I don't want to be drugged and all those wires and things. I want to say the last few moments with my family. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. When you look at the data from a place like Oregon that's had death with dignity for almost two decades now, the, the real drivers for why people end up choosing to take the medication are loss of autonomy, um, loss of enjoyment of life, and pain. And it's when things reach the, that tipping point, I think that's when people decide, my life is, is done. Um, but if you can still bear through it, if you can just take some opioids and continue on, most people want to yeah, actually want to, continue yeah. to do that. But where okay. is that tipping point, right, where you want to say, I, I just don't want any more? Well, and the tipping point is here and now. Yes. <laughs> because we have to come back to today and reality, and reality is we're out of time. Okay, okay. So please join us again. We welcome your comments. We do have a Facebook page, and it is uh, Navigating the Journey Hawaii. And please join us. We'd love to hear your comments. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Aloha.